meeting is now being recorded. <laughs> I'd like to um, start the meeting by um, asking that we remove agenda item 1.2, long-term budget forecast. Uh, President Flamer contacted me earlier this morning and requested that that be deleted. Would you like to speak to that uh, request, uh, President Flamer? Yes, ma'am, I would. Um, since Julia and I are working really hard to get the final budget ready for the September 1st board meeting, and there are so many assumptions that seem to be moving targets from the state, so we want to make sure that we provide the board with the most accurate information as we possibly can. So we're spending this weekend and all of next week just getting that final budget ready for us to put public. Um, does anyone like to speak like to speak to this or ask President Flamer any questions? Um, I would just comment that uh, acknowledging that it's a moving target. It's hard to uh, keep up with the all the incoming information. I know. I, I would add, I was able to sit in on um, the webinar last week, not this past week, but last week that dealt with um, budget, which was one of the best webinars I've sat in on these Thursdays. And uh, that was really the theme throughout the webinar. <laughs> you know, the, the man presenting kept saying, well, this or that. And he'd say, but, you know, I don't know, we don't know. And, um, but it, nonetheless, it was still interesting just to review of budgets in general. Trustee and last Thursday, I was going to say last Thursday, uh, Trustee Kelly and Trust, Trustee Matthews were on that webinar, which had even more details and shows how complicated this, all the scenarios are at this point. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't make, I, I had a conflicting appointment on Thursday, so I couldn't make that one. I'm so, I'm, I'm glad the three of you were there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm actually glad that we're removing one item. I think between 1.1, 3, and 4, we're going to take up all the time in the workshop anyway. Um, so do we need a motion, or how do we go about this? No, no it's removed from the agenda. Cool. A motion is needed. Oh. Wow, look at that power. Wow. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make sure it doesn't go to my head. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so um, let's start with uh, Agenda 1.1, 1 .1, um, speaking to our board goals. Um, I did notice, and I'm sorry I didn't notice it sooner, that the goals that were attached to the agenda um, are, are two, two years old. Uh -huh. Oh, shoot. They're the same that are posted on our web page. So uh, we've yeah. been using these for two years, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, no, the, I mean, the goals I have in front of me are goals 2019 to 2021. Oh, I don't have that. Uh, Cynthia, I, I was actually, I, I, then I went to the web page. And again, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't notice this until. This morning, I just thought the, the correct goals. Were I watched. can you uh, can I make you a co-host so that you can share your screen because I cannot get to them because I'm not in VPN when I'm I, in. I could only find a hard copy. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I printed them off the website and mm -hmm. and didn't realize either. I just didn't. I made the assumption that they were the right one. Yeah, I did the same thing, and I'm yeah. sorry I didn't notice sooner. I, I Excuse me, if, if memory serves me right, they're pretty darn close. I think we did alter one or two things. Yeah, mostly, I think, words. I don't know. I mean, that just... Uh, 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 Richard, do you have yours? Um, this is like, off of the website. Yeah, I know. It's right. right. That's what and we all have. That's, that's, that's what I did. It's, it's the wrong one, Cynthia. Do you have one? No. I don't. I can't get to one right now. R Richard, do you uh, have it on your minute. computer, no. aren't you? No. Okay, wait a minute. Didn't we review them in August? Why don't we do this? Are, are, are we ready for, um, can we go back to the agenda, please? 
are, are we ready? F Where are we now? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the agenda. Here we go. Um, is uh, Angelina um, ready for 1.2? Could we just skip ahead and then try to... 1.3, uh, open educational resources, 1.3? Well, now it's 1.2 because 1. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I would just like to comment that I found a hard copy of the 19 to 21 goals. Yeah, that's what I have. But um, I, I, don't, I don't have a way to share it. I suppose I could hand, show mine on the screen. Um, President Mallory? Yes. I may make a suggestion. Could you look at your hard copy and mm -hmm. where there is a difference between that and what we have on our screen articulated? We're so going to miss you, Trustee Emad. <laughs> you know, there's really quite quite a change. So, um, Cynthia, could could you put up the goals that we have sent out, and um, I'll see if I can get through this with Trustee Emad's excellent suggestion. I think there are quite different, but they are. I, I don't have them. You have the ones that you posted from the agenda. Right. That's Is what she was, I think that's what she was asking. Oh, okay. Open, I'm sorry. Open I, mis it up. I misunderstood. So the, the those different. of you that are on the committee that have a copy, is there any of you that could scan it onto your computer? at some point this morning and so then we could look at it if we went and skipped on to agenda item 1.2 and gave you time to do that um i don't really have a scanner oh. i can i have a okay. docu scan app and i can try that so yes what well, uh, is dr hill on could you Colleen, could you take a photo with your phone and then just text it to Cynthia? Yeah, I'll, I'll try doing all that, but I don't want to be wasting all your time while I'm um, fussing with this. I, I'm on the line, if you, Angelina, if you want. Yes, were you presenting alone or did you have a colleague presenting with you? I did, Kathy, and she is here also. Okay. Yes. If, if everyone is agreeable, do you mind if we move into uh, Dr. Hill's presentation and I'll try to docu-scan my um, goals? That's good. Okay. okay. Should I, I'll, I'll go ahead and begin then. Um, thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, I, I think convocation, um, went well. <laughs> um, President Flamer supported us and um, I think we, we pulled it off well. We're all a little tired, <laughs> so I apologize if I seem a little tired, um, but um, I think everything is going really well. Uh, for the Open Education uh, Resource Initiative uh, for the agenda item, uh, I've asked uh, uh, Kathy Cox, our Director of Library and Academic Support Center, to be here um, to, to help me lend her expertise. Uh, what I know about this initiative is my, my background at CR is when I started, we had a grant for an OER initiative when Director uh, Jeff Kane was working with distance education and um, what I observed with that initiative is it didn't, it was very underutilized by the faculty and we ended up not moving forward with the grant. So what I learned from that is that if you're going to have a successful OER initiative, you really need to get faculty buy-in. And so what has happened, and I'm going to turn it over in a second here for Kathy to really talk about various initiatives and talk about it in more depth, but um, what, what has evolved at CR 
is our faculty, I believe, are actually passionate about getting no cost and low cost options to students. So I don't think that that is, is the barrier uh, for us. Uh, when I send out um, I send out surveys each semester asking faculty to identify their uh, textbooks that are low cost uh, and are no cost and a large percentage of them do and they are very passionate <laughs> about making sure that that information gets displayed on our schedule of classes because as you know this ZTC LTC zero text cost, low text cost initiative is uh, mandated uh, in uh, law as of um, recently. So we do post that information with the symbols that accompany it. Um, now the way that our faculty primarily have created uh, low cost or zero cost uh, options is by creating their own course packets. So they find, um, articles, book chapters, different sources of information that they believe are um, high quality, and then they, they have that assembled into a packet for the students. And um, then we, uh, we have our uh, third-party uh, vendor um, go through it for cop copyright um, reasons to make sure that we are allowed to uh, use those resources in that way in a legal manner. <laughs> so that, that was a lot of work getting through that because uh, in the past we just um, let them use it and we were at copyright risk. So we totally um, corrected that. So we're in good shape there now. Um, and then the other thing that the faculty do is they find um, other uh, textbook versions, either online free or um, low cost uh, options. And recently the Barnes and Noble um, uh, online textbook adoption tool that we just rolled out has a module for OpenStax that provides faculty with options for low cost uh, textbooks and resources, online resources. Um, that are pretty easy for the faculty to navigate, to determine what they might be uh, interested in for their classes. And uh, Barnes and Noble at, at least believes that these are of higher quality than the completely free um, uh, options that are available. And some of the input I got back from faculty is why our initial OER uh, project didn't go terribly well with the faculty was that they were less than satisfied with the quality of the free uh, resources that were available to them. Now with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kathy because I she has more expertise uh, with where the OER where the initiative is now, how the quality of um, the information might be changing. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to, to Kathy to, to speak about the OER. Thank you. Um, OERs are a kind of a complicated subject in some ways because they're not just textbooks. OERs are, um, supposed to be. The, the definition on this, the California Virtual Campus website uh, points out that they're high quality teaching, learning, and uh, research resources that are in, either in the public domain or they've been released under an intellectual property license such as Creative Commons that allows them to be freely repurposed and reused. And it includes full courses in some cases. It can include um, course materials as well as modules and textbooks and um, media, streaming media, all sorts of things that are freely available to students and faculty to reuse in their courses. And they date back, the, the impetus for this began back in the, what, maybe 10 years ago, and it was kind of codified into the College Textbook Affordability Act, um, AB 798 in 2015. 
that's what led to the creation of what we think of now as the zero textbook cost de uh, degrees the, um, requ and the requirement that courses that allow their students, that students can complete without having to pay for any textbook materials be identified in the college catalog and in the, um, you know, with an icon that allows them to do that. And I don't know how many of those courses we have. I don't know how many we have that are completely free. But um, OERs, um, and they're commonly, there's the OER, which is the, the OER initiative, which is the Open Educational Resource Con Initiative. And you'll sometimes, you'll hear the OEI, which is the Online Education Initiative. So you have to kind of keep those two acronyms in mind so we don't get confused between what we're talking about here. Um, but there are courses on campus that are actually using true OERs that are available under Creative Commons license that faculty can edit and, and make available to their students. Can, can I add to that, Kathy? Yes, when yes, please. Out the ZTC survey, the true zero textbook cost, yes. um, it came in and about 10% of our courses were identified as ZTC, a lot more as LTC also. Right. And um, in fact, if I may share my screen for just a second here. Oh, it's disabled. Okay, that's fine. I don't you, need to do that. You can. Uh, can I? Okay, let's see. Um, let's you might need to be made a co-host, Cynthia. I did. There we go. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, I just wanted to pull that. up an example on my screen here, if I can find it. Whiteboard screen two, screen one is what I want. OERs. No, I'm not seeing it, and I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to waste time trying to find it. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, it's a little. I'm a little awkward with screen sharing sometimes. Um, but for example, I know that Professor Sales, Professor Lisa Sales, has an OER textbook that she adopted for her communications class a number of years ago, that was from Georgia. And I know this, I know that she adopted it because it had a chapter in it on using on research methods. And she asked the library faculty to revise that chapter to reflect not Georgia State library materials, but the library materials and research tools that are available here at CR. So we did that for her. But zero um, OERs could include streaming media and other things that are available to students at um, you know, that faculty can embed into their courses. I am, the library here is not actually involved in that process as much as some universities or colleges might because we, the faculty tend to go out and find those resources on their own and embed them into their courses, but we are here to serve as a resource if we can. Um, I'd like to add, Kathy, um, and I need your help for this. Yes. Can you remind me, and Trustee Deister might be particularly interested in this, um, can you remind me the name of the publishing company that has that unique, um, I know nursing uses it, where the students buy basically like a license to the mm -hmm. company and then they get a wealth of, of what would be fairly expensive books available to them at one cost. I forget that Oh. That is, there are several publishing companies that do that. The one that you're probably thinking of is Cengage. Sen yes, yes. Yes. Cengage okay. Unlimited. I forget the technical name for that type of licensing. I do know that the California State Library has issued a, an advisory to libraries throughout the state, both academic and public that that type of licensing they believe does not well serve the students in the end because many publishers, and I do not know if Cengage is one of them, but many publishers that make that type of licensing available have embedded into their contracts an ongoing renewal fee that students have to actively opt out of if they don't want to extend it beyond that year. And that was something that I was not aware of until I, had, I saw that. I was very excited by that possibility initially as well. Where, where we also use that is in our uh, computer information system, mm -hmm. as well as our business technology. Um, now I've received good feedback from those faculty about this service for and their students. 
So maybe they've either, they do a good job of instructing their students to make sure to opt out, or maybe they don't have right. to opt out. And I'm not arguing against it, because if a, if a discipline, when I was talking with some of our faculty about that initially, when I was made aware of it as an option, I, I suggested that it might be most appropriate where there was a sequence of courses that used similar books from the same publishers. It's an obvious attempt by the publishers to get faculty to use their resources exclusively. And in some disciplines, that's appropriate. And in other disciplines, then that may encourage faculty to use materials that they wouldn't otherwise use because there might be better materials out there. And those technically are not OERs exactly because they are not free to the student and the, and the faculty cannot modify them. Um, and and I'll just add, typically the, those books in this program are very expensive. Yes, yeah. yes. And so there's a significant cost savings to the students there. And it can serve the students well. The, the warning was mainly that it, if it's not properly handled, it, it can cause students to have recurring expenses that they're not aware of. So I think it's more a matter of transparency and making those costs known. And, in, and making sure that it's possible for students to get out of them easily if they need to. And I think they're most popular in health occupations. Health occupations and computer science and yes. computer information mm -hmm. science seem to be the ones that would be most likely to use that. And I, like I said, they're only one vendor that does this. They're the one I know the best. There are other vendors that do that. Um, I have heard, I do know that there are textbooks available in a wide variety of disciplines. I also know that, our, um, that there are some faculty who have concerns about the quality. For example, um, I know our math faculty are very, very firmly enamored of a book that is no longer in easy access to students that they are allowing their students to use very old editions of because can, can I add to that Kathy our, our math faculty uh, went so far as to create their own um, textbook right and that they give to students at zero cost and they have and they have taken other means for example a subject like algebra or um, trigonometry where the, su the subject matter doesn't change very much. I mean, algebra is algebra is algebra. And they have a textbook that they really like, and most of the faculty teaching that class have chosen to use an edition of the textbook that is, you know, probably 15 years old, 20 years old, and can be purchased online in used form for five or six dollars. And can I so, add to and that? We have, copies of, we have copies in the library also to check out for students for the full term because it's so cheap. We have many, many, many copies that they can check out. Yes. And, and um, so for the book that the math faculty made, for both that and um, for their um, OptiMath, which is the online uh, tool help students um, go work through problems. We get, um, we, not so much for OptiMath anymore because that technology is um, getting to end of life, but for the textbook, we get contacted from other colleges and other instructors wanting to use our resource. <laughs> so the OEI, I mean the OERI, the o Open Educational Resources Initiative is actually an initiative of the State Academic Senate. So it is a faculty-driven initiative. And I don't know, because I'm not faculty, I, I don't know the extent to which our ac current Academic Senate is involved in, or do you know, Angelina, have they done not, anything? Not terribly. I think ever since that grant we had, there's a little bit of a bad taste in the mouth of the Senate with the true OER um, initiative. Now we could try to work to, to turn that around if the resources are much better now. Um, My sense is that because so many colleges around the state have, be, have been doing this ever since AB 798 was, uh, was passed, the, the level of quality has been improving and I know that the state Senate has, there are state weekly webinars on OER and there are, they're archived on the academic Senate website, the state Senate website. 
So I can send link, I can send a list of appropriate links to some of that information if you want to try and work with the faculty on that. But I, I agree with your assessment that unless faculty get behind it, this is not something that can be pushed top down. I have spoken to faculty about it. I know some faculty are very enthusiastic about it. There's a strong desire among faculty to reduce cost to our students to the greatest extent they can. But at some point, may, I didn't know the history of it on this campus except very, very generally, but that explains a lot that it may be that, you know, that there was a sense at that time that it might have been being forced on faculty or pushed in some way. And as we all know, the, the harder you push, the more people dig their heels in and, and resist. So um, there's a lot of material out there. There are a lot more textbooks available through various sources like OpenStax. And there are um, multiple national repositories of OER materials that can be searched. My, my hope is that as they start to navigate OpenStax in this new online adoption tool, mm -hmm going to find things that they like and it will increase right. the number of uh, free uh, although the most of the open stacks isn't completely free it's it's a very low cost it's very low cost but if they are well because if they wanted to get printed copies of it and printed copies oers are not all digital materials they are not all going to be online so remember OERs are under, uh, are they in the public domain or they're creative cop commons? So that's just the, a matter of copyright and whether they can be modified by the instructor who to suit the needs of the class. That doesn't mean they're absolutely free because if you want to print, if you want to issue printed copies that students can have in their hands, there will be a cost simply to copy and print the items and that's and distribute them in the case of things sold through the bookstore so that's probably where the cost is coming in and the you know the fact that there's still <laughs> licensing fees is why they're so inexpensive i want to clear up one one misconception that i hear from faculty and um it seems to be out there also like I said, they're not all digital materials. They can be either digital or print or hard copy. The library, even with our wonderful new library catalog system, which has offered us a lot of advantages, it has the capability of handling what are called electronic resource, electronic reserves for students. The problem is that there is, the reason we did not implement that, and a lot of community colleges around the state have not implemented that module in our libraries yet, is because e-reserves are still very, very labor intensive in terms of setting up the courses every semester and adding, you know, linking the materials in and so forth. And because you can link in materials that are copyright protected where you have to do the research and get the copyright permissions, as well as these OERs that are open and creative commons. You have to track whether you're copy, you have copyright permission to load things digitally so students can access them electronically. And so they're not exactly the same. I mean, I don't want to go get into the weeds with this and divert attention, but just because something is an OER does not mean it's always available electronically. And it doesn't mean that we necessarily can provide a digital link to it through the library's catalog system. And you know, that's, that's all I'm going to go to with that. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I think that that ends our presentation. Okay. With this point, we'd like to turn it over to the trustees uh, to see if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Hill, and thank you, and Ms. Cox. Um, that was an interesting presentation. I'm really pleased to hear all the progress that we're making at CR in making use of these open educational resources. Are there any questions out there? I have a question. Uh, yes, Trustee Biggin. Um, I, I appreciate the presentation and um, the clarification of the difference between OER and OEI because I get those confused. Um, I, I noticed that, um, that Kathy presented uh, during convocation on Thursday on online resources and I wonder how she 
how she felt the attendance was for that presentation that she did on using, you know, online use of the library. Uh, thank you for asking. It was fairly well attended. I had or between, I think I had about 18 to 20 faculty attending, which is fairly good for a library presentation. And we were presenting directly opposite another, another session. So there was some diversion of attention there. And I've had several faculty who weren't able to attend contact me. They want to see the recording of the presentation. So there, there's definitely a lot of interest there. Um, so there, there is interest and the library has been working. And those are basically. I'm sorry. I was going to say that those are basically free resources too, aren't they, that you were sharing? Library resource, I was showing faculty how the changes in our system and how they can access those materials for their, faculty, for their students. I showed them, yes, I showed them our databases, for example, um, articles from our research databases can be embedded into their, their courses. Um, we have two, currently have two streaming media databases. Um, I don't know whether we'll be able to keep both of them past the end of the year, but we have had at least one streaming media database for a long time now that student, that faculty can take clips or videos from. They're fully light, they're fully captioned and able to be used in courses online. And then, um, yeah, I was showing them that. I was showing them how they can get reference help, how their students can get access to the laptop lending program. So it was more than just the, with the materials. But yes, there, there was a lot of interest in that. And they are very, taking very good advantage of that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I think Trustee Kelly had a question. Yeah, I, I have a couple. So um, thank you for your presentation, by the way. Um, being so thorough, I, I learn more about this every time, but when I go to the conferences, I'm hearing about it at this esoteric state level, and it's nice to hear what we're doing locally. Thank you. Um, you guys had mentioned that faculty were passionate about the OER, but are they incentivized? In other words, do they have protected time to work on this? Um, is there any kind of pay for performance, pay bonus kind of thing for them developing these kinds of materials. I, I imagine that, you know, if you were to, if you were to give me access to do this, but it required a lot of work, I still might not do it because it's just not my top priority because I don't have the time or capacity for it on top of all my other responsibilities. So I wonder if you could speak to that. And then the second thing, um, I wonder, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Hill, you mentioned that 10% were free in our course catalog that you had uh, found. And then you had mentioned uh, another per percentage maybe that weren't free but were very low cost. And you mentioned an acronym that I'd like to capture so that I understand what it is, like LZ. Uh, the I, can speak to, I can speak to both of those questions. Um, so... Well, and then I have... I have uh, one, one more. I just want to throw them all out there so that you can just go. Um, okay. How has the pandemic, the pandemic pivot affected all of this uh, in terms of uh, workload and pressure from faculty to get stuff done? Um, and then is there any way to engage students, associate faculty, volunteer faculty to maybe help faculty create these materials? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I, you might need to remind me as I go through these what they were, but I can speak to all of them. So the first uh, question, um, oh boy, what was, I'm sorry. The first question, incentiv incentivizing? Okay, yes. So, uh, I, yes, what, what um, faculty Maria Friedman, or, oh shoot, I think she changed her name just recently. Um, she biology faculty uh, full-timer and she um, she acquired a grant um, uh, recently um, she's amazing and she acquired a grant to pay herself to be able to develop open uh, resources in biology um, so we I think it was an NSF grant so we were very proud it was an NSF grant we were very proud of her for doing that and um, President Flamer has put 
um, I believe blogged about it. <laughs> yes. And um, we, um, in terms of, so anytime there are grants available, I believe um, Kathy has announced grant opportunities for OERs and we pursue them. Um, when it's, it's, it's better when it's individual faculty seeking the grants because they're, you know, definitely going to develop the resources then. Um, now, um, we, in terms of like uh, incentivizing, like for example, the math department got a grant a long time ago to develop, to help them get computers and various things. I think it got them the server that allowed them to develop OptiMath. Uh, Keith is shaking his head. This predates me, um, but I think I'm right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so they got a grant to do that. That allowed them to do, I don't know if it supported their textbook also, but I, I know it supported OptiMath. And then when OptiMath, because the server was dying, and the tech, the, they used, um, oh goodness, Trusty Kelly, you'll know. Um, they use Mac uh, Unix uh, technology to develop it. And so then when um, Bruce Wagner and uh, Dave Arnold retired, they were the only ones who knew how to use that technology. Um, RIT department does not use uh, Unix. They use um, PC <laughs> uh, technology. So what we did was we compensated a couple of the math faculty to move what was in, or not literally move, but to redevelop the what was provided through OptiMath in a new um, software tool. It, it is a free, it's, it's not a pre proprietary tool, but it is not one that we developed ourselves, but they created the, um, the math questions, the answers, you know, they, and we compensated them, um, I believe in release uh, to, to do that. Um, the next questions, the acronyms, uh, so, uh, and these are ones that were mandated uh, actually to use and to provide in our, there are logos that were created for us to put in our schedule of classes. So zero textbook cost is uh, ZTC. And um, if, if I can do this, I'll try it. Um, uh, in our schedule of classes, I'll try to just show you what these look like. The other one is um, low cost, uh, low textbook cost, and that's LTC. And um, I'm trying to bring up our schedule of classes here really quickly so that I can um, show you what the logos look like. Um, but we will see if I am, <laughs> if I am able to do this. Um, and you know what, I'm, I'm not going to mess with this right now, sorry. Um, so then the next, um, um, another question, I've lost them, I'm sorry. Okay, um, uh, let's see. So uh, I was curious if, uh, how the pandemic pivot has affected all of this. And I was also curious if there's a way to leverage uh, students or associate faculty or volunteer faculty to help faculty um, accomplish this. I'm also curious, you know, I, I think I've asked this question before, uh, President Flamer, I'm not sure uh, if I remember what the answer was, but I'll, oftentimes I'll hear grants are the magic fairy tool to make things happen on campus, and I'm curious if there are dedicated grant resources that will help these faculty write these grants, because again, going and getting a grant is no small feat either. And so it's almost like it's, it's one more thing for faculty to do in order to make this happen. And I just think that as a board, maybe it's a foundation goal. If we can remove some of these barriers for these faculty to create these OER resources, so much the better for our students, so. Okay, I can speak to those. Um, so first for the, I'll just take the last question first. So that way, I'll probably have forgotten the other questions by the time. I'm sorry. Okay, so for the for the for the grant issue, um, let me um, try to share my screen here. 
This will stop other screen sharing. Okay, that's okay. And then I'm gonna, okay, here we go. Okay, so I sent this email out, if you can see it, uh, this morning at 8.23 a.m. to, um, this is to our uh, manager of advising and outreach, our Dean of Enrollment Services, our director of the Del Norte campus, our DE coordinator um, in faculty and uh, instructional technologist with uh, President Flamer and uh, attached as well as Anna Calderon, who is not an employee of the district. Sorry, let me make this much bigger for you. I apologize. Um, she's not an employee of the district, but um, she is a, a professional grant writing consultant that we work with. She got us, I mean, we all pitched in, of course, and worked with her a great deal, but she oversaw the um, Innovation Award for Pelican Bay. She oversees our TRIO uh, awards that we get. She is, uh, we're working with her. We just submitted a grant for um, technology for remote uh, locations that would give us those, um, those uh, remote servers for students to remote into from KT and, and Del Norte, um, as well as helping out with Wi-Fi in the parking lots. Um, and then uh, we're, we're about to apply, Dr. Uh, Dean Mayer and I are about to meet with her next week to talk about a grant for an aquaculture program. Um, and then in this email I sent this morning, you can see that I'm trying to get a little healthy competition among our staff um, to, to see if um, we can go for this grant through the advertised right now through the Hanover uh, research um, folks. So um, one of the possibilities for this grant could be the development of OERs. I don't know that that would register as high as some other things that we might be able to do in terms of actually being awarded the grant. Um, in terms of dedicated resources, President Flamer um, employed um, uh, Dr. Ed Macon, who is our music faculty, but incredibly analytic and he gave him release the last couple years to, um, he secured the nursing grant that allowed us to bring online the RN, uh, the LVN to RN bridge program in Del Norte. Um, he secured, um, um, he secured several grants with Marty Coelho uh, for the um, housing and secure initiatives. And then, um, President Flamer, do you know the status of the USDA uh, grant that he was working on? Yes, and thanks to Ed, we were awarded 200000 from USDA for our police force. Great. So, um, um, unfortunately, um, Dr. Macon was not able to do release this year because he needs to keep his program, the, our music program afloat. And because of the pandemic, he didn't believe he would be able to do both. Um, however, I have started working so closely with Anna that I'm learning her tricks. <laughs> so, so I'm hopeful that we will be able to acquire grants on our own with little intervention and support um, in, the, in the future because there are, you have to know, like you have to know when a grant comes out, how much should you ask for to be competitive? You have to know what to ask for to be competitive and different types of grants are, are very different in terms of how you approach them. So I've been learning um, a lot about that with under Anna's guidance. So I don't tell Anna, because <laughs> she, she wants to be doing this work for us, uh, but she is a fabulous resource and we will continue uh, to work with her on the larger um, grants. I, I just feel thrilled that you guys have all this in place and to hear about the details of it, thank you. I've thought about it, I've worried about it. Uh, various occasions as we get to board meetings. <laughs> Often I'm not thinking about it until we're preparing for some of the agenda items that we see, but uh, great to hear. Thank you. And then the pandemic, um, I mean, the, the odd thing is that we did roll out the new textbook uh, adoption tool during the shelter in place. <laughs> so that kind of confounds um, all of this. However, 
yesterday I, I got an email from, um, well, you guys all are familiar with Professor Blakemore, and he was like, oh my goodness, Angelina, I am converting all of the resources in my literature class for students um, away from an extensive textbook and to these free um, all these free articles and, and passages and things. And he's like, oh my goodness, it's so much work. It's, you know, he was kind of kindly complaining a little bit, not really complaining, just kind of stating where he was at. And, and I said, you know, I'm so sorry. That's a lot to take on right now. I'm kind of surprised you took that on right now. And, and he said, well, you know what? I'm really glad I did because long-term it's going to be really good for students and it was a lot of work, but it was something really good to do. So I, I, my guess is probably most folks are not deciding to tackle something like that right now, um, but um, obviously some are. <laughs> and I, I think um, as we move forward, uh, especially if the, the institution um, kind of assists faculty in their options of, of how to, to do this, um, we'll see more and more faculty wanting to, to go down this road. Thank you for the presentation and the answer to the questions. Appreciate you both. Are there any further questions? Well, as Danny has already said, thank you both for taking the time this Saturday. I know it's been a busy week uh, getting the new academic year started. So um, greatly appreciate it. Hope you get some rest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we flip back to agenda item 1.1? The board goals have been discovered. And uh, oh, great. thank you, Carol Matthews, Trustee Matthews. She scanned a copy, I scanned a copy. Um, but then, and of course, these scans don't really come out all that well. Right, this is good. They, mine would not have looked like this. <coughs> but yes. Um, can, you but make I, the font, uh, can you make the font just a little bigger on that? So Cynthia has worked her magic. And uh, right. oh, that's great. No, thank you. That's no, Dr. Flame it emailed it to me. Doesn't matter. We're right. I did email everybody a copy. So Oh, thank a you. photo of a copy, a yeah. photo, but you can look, you'll have it afterwards if you don't find a hard copy. Yeah, I think you'll, and thank you, Trustee Matthews. Um, I think you'll find uh, this a little bit of an easier read. And again, it's only because the scans don't come out. Um, this oh yeah, no, this is much better. Um, uh, Trustee Doran, did you want to lead this or did you have something you wanted to add to this? Um, no, not really. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't know what you. I, I didn't know what you wanted to do about the one that Sally um, sent us that we all got from Sally. Our, yeah, and uh, and I do want to address and that. You and I discuss that at all before we do these, or? Well, you and I had just a brief email exchange the other day about this, and I wasn't sure if there was something you wanted to um, speak to about um, committee discussions. Well, I think the only thing I was I said was that, you know, when we did that summary and sent it out to everybody, we wanted to, um, we thought the board should discuss um, goal uh, fiscal responsibility and the vision and how we could better support the foundation. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, I think uh, Trustee Doran's suggestion is a good one that we can start off by looking at the recommendation that Sally had sent to me and I sent to Keith and it then was sent out to you, uh, which was a, a goal that um, dealt with issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, Trustee Degan, do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, let me uh, pull my copy up. Um. And uh, Cynthia, could you take us back to that second tab? Are you? Other than model, we, uh, uh, this is Trustee Mott. Are we going to have an opportunity to talk about those goals later on, or are we done with them? Oh, no, we're not done with them at all. Oh, I, okay. I, I wanted to look at what Trustee Biggin was uh, rec recommending to see if we wanted to add it 
Oh, okay. And, um, and then we'll, well go back. No. Go there, there was just, there was just some language in this. This was just adopted by Cerritos College and, and sent to me by their board president, uh, Dr. Ferrero, who is the uh, president of Cerritos College. And uh, they, they approved a combination of board slash president's goals. Now it's maybe a little premature to do that this year, but in the future, it sounded like it made sense that the board's goals and the president's goals would synchronize uh, or, and even possibly become one document at some point. Um, what I also liked about this document, and not that we have to take any of this to put into this year's goals, but since we're talking about creating board goals, I just wanted to share it for maybe future reference, but they have a kind of an introductory statement that um, in the third paragraph where it says, you know, we will measure our success by evaluating whether we are closing the achievement gaps of disproportionately impacted students through a system that is equitable for all students, faculty, staff, and managers in our entire community. Um, at some point, I, I hope that we can call out the fact that, um, you know, we, we are trying to address equity and, and trying to close the achievement gap. Um, their goal A, strengthening the culture of completion. You know, they um, then, you know, list their different strategies for, for the culture of completion. They've tried to take their goals and align them to the chancellor's uh, call for action and, and vision for success. Um, uh, uh, let me see what else was down here that I wanted to make a comment on. Um, oh, a goal C on promoting uh, leadership and staff development. Uh, point number B or 1B where it says increase professional development opportunities that focus on emotional intelligence and recognizing systems of inequalities. I'm not suggesting that we would, you know, make a reference to emotional intelligence, but some, something about um, uh, being, you know, culturally sensitive or recognizing um, structural um, biases or uh, systems of inequalities um, that we might, uh, some of this uh, newer language we might uh, think of incorporating into our goals in the future. So, you know, those are some of the points I wanted to share. I don't know if uh, President Flamer or Colleen, if you or, or Richard, I had sent him a copy of this because he's chaired the goal committee, you know, the board goals committee, if there was anything else about this that resonated that um, could be considered in the future. Um, this is Can I say uh, something or? Yeah. Uh, Yes. Yeah. Why don't you go so, ahead, Jordan? Yeah. So, I mean, Sally, I, I really appreciate it. And when I read it, I thought, wow. And I thought, well, we would be starting from scratch. Um, so I was appreciative when you said um, next year. And, if, and I think you're right on with the, the board goals and the president goals should be aligned and together. And if I remember correctly, at the, this retreat, in fact, where we had one in July, where we laid out the president's goals and right next to ours. And we went through them to make sure they were in alignment. Um, so yeah. so that's, that, that's really what I thought. I thought these were good, but I mean, we would actually, I thought would have to have a committee and start from scratch basically with our goals. Yeah, I agree. No, I'm not suggesting that. I just, since, you know, once a year we have this big serious discussion about board goals. And I thought, well, I would throw something into the pot for future consideration uh, because I know there's a lot of work that goes in that the committee puts into putting the goals together. And I certainly appreciate the goals that we're, we will be discussing. And, and maybe there's a few little word tweaks, but I'm certainly not suggesting that we have to rein, reinvent them at this point. No, and I think you're, you're I, like I said, you're right on that the, the committee next year should be doing this. But we may want to take, like you just mentioned, that these have the introductory paragraph. 
And I think that, you know, I don't know that we could do that today, but that sure would be something that maybe the committee could work on and bring to a board meeting and the whole board could have an input and we could add that, I think, potentially, depending upon what everyone else thought. President Mullery? Yes, please, um, Trustee Matthews. Uh, so first of all, uh, having found the current goals, they were a big improvement over the ones from the previous year. Yes. Um, I, uh, I kind of got an, in, an intense work this week because I did the Chancellor's Office webinar, uh, which was on um, uh, structural racism. Um, and then uh, this triple CT one, which was on equity and hiring and had to do with increasing diversity and how a board can be involved in that because we can't really direct, you know, actions. Um, and then the, um, our own uh, uh, convocation, the first two hours of the convocation on, uh, on Thursday. And my thought, um, Again, it will take some time, so it's not that we should just leap into today and try to, to, to change these at this point. I wouldn't suggest that. But the combination of those discussions, what Sally sent, I would, I would like to see our goals, and they were improved a lot, um, still be more um, aspirational in a sense, uh, more expectation, more setting a tone and I think the board has really um, in setting those goals we really have the ability to influence with them perhaps more than we have in that our goals have kind of been uh, how do we meet our responsibilities you know are we doing our job how do we you know what's our role in in doing these things but we can also it kind of as modeled in the, in the uh, Cerritos ones, we can set a tone and expectation and an aspiration. And I would really like to see us, um, you know, work on that idea. And uh, they did it with this overarching goal and with, with their statements, that's good. We could modify uh, some of our itemized goals, but uh, I would like to see that. And what I was really impressed with um, from these various conversations uh, this week was, um, and of course, a lot of other input, but two things. One, that, and we've heard this before, that student success and, and equity in, in student success uh, happens when you when students see someone like them uh, in front of the classroom uh, that is their professors and the second one uh, had to do with curriculum with which again we do not have a hands-on role but which we can I think set a, an, an aspirational kind of goal a directive kind of goal that we would like to see and that is that students succeed better when they see themselves reflected in the curriculum and that was me very powerful to me. It just reminded me all of a sudden of all of the elements when we learn history and all of the things that we learn have been left out of our history textbooks. And I think that's at least part of what that was talking about. But even in science, math, whatever, are you talking about diverse experts in the field? Are you talking about diverse uh, people who've generated uh, you know, theorems or facts or studies or whatever. And I, I would, I just thought that was very powerful. And so I would hope that we can look at how our goals uh, not only assure that we are, you know, meeting our responsibility and that we are looking at, at our concerns regarding fiscal and et cetera, but, but that we are kind of setting a tone ourselves um, in, in those goals that would, that's my thought this week. Thank you. That was well said. Uh, Trustee Emad, I, I had the sense that you wanted to speak to these goals. Uh, yeah, I, on the uh, goal number, hold on, uh, uh, three, uh, 
I, given, given the fluid uh, conditions that we are in and given the uncertainty that future holds, and, uh, and I happen to be on the side of pessimism on this, I think if the, if the state of California thinks that they're going to have $2 billion in deficit, it is going to be four. And so uh, uh, I, I have a uh, difficulty with necessary reserves because that is such a uh, word that is subject to uh, uh, interpretation. And when push comes to shove, necessary could be bare minimum or necessary could be, you know, ACCJC for all we know could drop the 5% to 2%, and then necessary becomes 2%. I think we need to put a number in there that this board feels comfortable and necessary and gives us enough cushion for those bad times that is coming our way. Thank you. Didn't we, didn't we do that in trying to think where? Because there was some place where we stated that our, our goal was 10%. Yeah, we have yeah. that policy. It, that's in policy, okay. But when it comes to our goal, we say as necessary. I, I got it. I, I No, I understand. And it may be that we want to say uh, with, uh, I mean, we could refer to our policy. We could state a number. We could change the word necessary to adequate or uh, whatever we chose. But, but could uh, we, could we be? specific take away necessary and say with a reserve of 10 percent that would be my preference whatever that number the board agrees that we put in a number rather than no. necessary I, I think you're right i'm glad you raised this i think we could go two ways one would be to put a number in another is to say maintain a balanced general fund in compliance with our budget policies and then if both our, of those are acceptable to me if our budget policy changes from 10% to 12% or whatever, we're going to be right. applying the policy. Right. I think that's a, a good idea. And I think that, uh, not, I mean, I, I, I like the goal of 10%. It would be nice to reach that goal. I don't know if it isn't even just going to be more difficult in the next couple of years. You know, I think we're going to be hanging on to our <laughs> to our reserve with the skin of our teeth and uh, I, I agree with it, it should be 10%. I like the suggestion of, of uh, referring to board, go, uh, board policy. Uh, Trustee Dorn, as, as chair of this uh, committee, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I'm just really worried of putting a percentage out there because we all know what the, I, I mean, I understand Trustee Emod's thoughts and agree with them, but just looking at the, the situation and the other thing is, isn't the reserve supposed to be for a, you know, a disastrous time or dire time? And that's pretty much what we're in right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in, a, in one of the worst times in our, my history on the board, we're going to try to increase the reserve. I, I don't know. That, that's just my concern, but I, I, I'm, I'm happy to go with what everybody else thinks is appropriate. That was my point, that it's, it is, it, that, uh, the goal is worthy. I wouldn't want to drop the goal. I'm just acknowledging that it's been, it is going to be even more difficult to increase our reserve balance in the next couple of years. It's going to be so much pressure on the budget. Right. So, and what is ACJC? Do they, do they do they have a percentage they throw out, they throw out that they recommend? Five percent. Five. And that's not recommended. That's required. Required. Okay. Maybe we should. And the average. Required. Oh, Trustee Deister, please. Uh, Trustee Deister is speaking. Maybe, maybe we should just stay where they're required because it's going to be so difficult, like you say, in the next couple of years, to have enough money to keep going. Okay. To set it higher is just going to be unreachable, probably. 
Yeah, I think that might have been thinking behind the word necessary. But I, I agree with uh, Trustee Imad, necessary is an ambiguous term. Sally, I'm sorry, Trustee Biggin, you were going to... Well, well, maybe a suggestion, if I may, uh, uh, President Maury, uh, yeah. maybe we should say uh, our reserves would be no less than required by ACCJC and follow our own stated goal and policy if achievable. That way we're basically saying between five to 10% if we can achieve that, but not to drop below the 5%. I like that idea. I do too. Because that's, that's reflecting reality and at the same time not letting go of the goal of increasing them, which is a good goal. Yeah. Is that five percent one point? What is that? One point five million? Yes. Round numbers. Yes, it is. So ten percent would be three million. I mean, I I mean that's very great and lofty, but I just don't. We can have three. I don't. I just don't see how we could do that. President Mallory, we are right now with our budget. Point of order. Um, in this virtual world, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out how to um, ask a question without interrupting. I'm wondering, I'm using the digital tool to raise my hand. I'm trying to do it on the camera. <laughs> Should I just jump in? Yeah. How would you prefer? Yeah, th this, I think in a workshop, we can be a little bit more relaxed. So okay. just go for it. Well, well and uh, Dr. Flamer, I saw that you're hand was raised and I'd like to hear what you have to say about this in particular and then I have a, a couple of questions and comments. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> I, have, I have two comments. One, if, if, I, I would like the trustees to remember that if you put in a document like the board goals that you, you have at least 5% that when new contracts come up for negotiation and people want a raise, which they will ask for, and we have a document that says 5%, they, they will say, well, the board said they only want 5%, so give us more of a cost of living increase because the board only said 5%. And 5% is only, it's, it's less than a month of payroll in case things go south for us. So please keep in mind that whatever you put in your board goals, our unions will look at it in, in our negotiation process and use that to get higher wages. So I, I'd be reticent to say 5% because that's really, that's zero for us. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank, thank you. And, and I, if I may, um, Trustee Kelly, thank you for mentioning the hand raising. I didn't, I wasn't seeing those little blocks in the gallery. So, now I see them. So thank you, Danny. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I see that Trustee Biggin has her hand raised. Oh, <laughs> I, took my, I, I, I took my hand down. Do you mind if I? Oh, go, go, go for it. Danny. I'm waiting for a bit. Um, so, uh, so I know I'm the guy who was proposing that we do SMART goals <laughs> with specificity <laughs> last workshops. But I absolutely agree with uh, kind of the sentiment behind what Dr. Flamer was saying here, that these things need to be loose and not just for salary negotiations, but also because of the loosey goosey nature of a global pandemic and all the stuff we're pivoting on. Like the bottom line is we need language that leaves us flexible to respond to the needs of the college and ultimately the students and the faculty. And, and uh, so Dr. Muller, I thought that your suggestion at the beginning of the outset of this conversation was a good one. I thought that it gave us some ambiguity and some specificity there. Um, I've also heard a lot of community colleges target 7% um, at these conferences. I hear people talk about 7% all the time. I know the 5% is what the ACJC uh, recommends, but um, can we go back real quick? Because we, we kind of pivoted off of discussions around point two on student equity. And I wanted to say some things about that. Um, as you guys know, in a lot of the board meetings, I've said 
aspirational goals and vision are incredibly important for our role as a board. And I absolutely agree with that. And thank you, Dr. M or, um, Trustee Matthews for bringing that up. Um, but the thing I took away from the board workshop or the, the, the webinar the other was action. <laughs> I was so energized after that presentation because I was hearing boards talk about action. And in the, in the, the, the weekly um, trustee webinar where they kind of followed up uh, the chancellor's webinar, I, I saw boards grappling with action. And Trustee Matthews, I appreciate that you mentioned about the discussion about how boards need to be careful about how they get involved in that because we are, we are not at the operational nuts and bolts level. All of that having been said, I want us to put some actionable stuff in our goals for point two. One of the things that maybe we can do, and I know I've talked about this before and it's kind of been vague and we haven't landed on a way to do it, I would like a dashboard. The institutional effectiveness uh, tableau page that the college has been building out, have you visited it? It's like, it's amazing. And student equity is embedded in all of these different dashboards all over the place. I want a dashboard dedicated to equity. One where we can track the goals and the progress of equity in one place. What is it about equity that we're trying to do? Because it can be so aspirational and it can be so fuzzy that we, that we don't actually do anything actionable that we can measure and tell and show and, and make progress on. So that's one. Two, you know, I, I, I also made the mistake of getting the 18, 19 goals and, and printing them out and wow, these goals that you guys are presenting here, 1921, so much different. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your work on it. Um, but I was looking at number three of the 1819 goals for student access, success and equity. And we had one paragraph in there and it, it's mostly aspirational and fuzzy. And when I look at what we have for point two, much better. But I would also like to see a bullet under point two about the dashboard, like I mentioned. And second, about going through and revising our mission statement and our vision statement to include words about equity. Because I think we often talk about diversity, but we don't talk about um, equity as often. And equity is the component that gets it done, right? Um, so, uh, and then the last thing I wanna say is again, uh, uh, Trustee Matthews hit it on the head by talking about how students need to see that the faces of the institution look like them. And I just want us to pause for a minute and look at all the white, uh, wealthier, wealthier socioeconomic status we see on the board meeting today. Uh, I know I've mentioned sometimes to Dr. Flamer, maybe I should step back and let somebody else come up and I know that that's caused some panic and I don't want white guilt to influence a bunch of these decisions but at a time where we have a lot of potential change on our board, maybe we should include some of these EEO practices in how our community picks people to be on this. I know we're political and not employment, but I'm just saying we don't really look very diverse right here. Okay, I'm done. Thank you for listening to me, rant. I love you guys, I'm sorry. Thank you, Trustee Kelly. If you don't mind, I'd like to get some closure on 3A before we move back to well, 2. I think we were almost there. Uh, I have, I had my hand raised on the yeah. icon. Right, and, and I'm going to you right now. Go ahead, Sally. Okay, okay. I wanted to get back to um, the uh, the fiscal one that uh, Trustee Emod brought up. Yes. Um, I wanted to mention that they say small school districts need larger reserves than most because, you know, they are small and we should be able to do two to three months worth of uh, reserves. 
Uh, but I also thought it was interesting that the average reserve in California for community colleges is 25%. Yeah. 25%. So we're, I think we shouldn't even be talking about 5%. Um, if anything, we should be looking at three months, what, what three months would be. And, and it should be part of our policy. And I like the idea as to per board policy, because if it's such a fiscal issue and we policy, you know, then we can change the board policy. But I right. think our uh, much uh, needs to give us the guidance. I, I agree, Trustee Big, and the ACCJC is not a recommendation, the 5%. It's a, you know, you drop below 5% and um, we're going to come in and possibly close you up. So I wouldn't call it a recommendation. <coughs> um, is your hand still up? I mean, it's all up on my screen. Well, it's not up on my screen. Oh. It's oh. down. Yeah, it takes to... a while. To... Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I'm looking to see if there are other hands. Oh. So are, are we, oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Matthews, go ahead. Um, I would just, I was going to say if, if uh, I, I was going to ask um, President Flamer, if, if we were talking about a reserve that would cover three months, what percentage would that be? We and would need, we would need between 15 and 17%. 15 to 17. Okay. I, 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 I want to, uh, I know Colleen wants to um, wrap up this 3A and, and I, I think now that I would agree about referring, just referring to board policy because uh, I understand not wanting to, to put 5% out there and then, you know, have said, but, you know, I understand that point exactly. And board policy, we can review and change any time. Right. And that makes it more flexible. Than, than goals that we're looking at on a two-year schedule here. Yes. So if, if you're in agreement, um, can we change 3A to say something like maintaining a balanced general fund that is in compliance with board policy reserves? or maintaining a balanced general fund with reserves that are in compliance with board policy. That would be fine with me. You're muted, Richard, and sometimes uh, people can't see all of the cameras, so just a uh, no, point. I just wanted to say- Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm having somewhat of a, a problem with, we're making a, a policy a goal. The policy be the policy that we follow. I mean, doesn't that seem a little odd? I don't. I think the. Uh, I think our. I think we're saying that the goal is maintaining a balanced general fund with reserves. That's the goal, and the goal isn't really the policy. The goal is maintaining, maintaining it, and we are defining what it might be uh, by referring policy to policy. should be enforced, actually. I mean, the policy is a policy, and if we, we got in trouble before for not following policy. Yeah, but, but we're in strange times, and I think having a goal to maintain reserves and, and somehow labeling them as necessary in today's world <laughs> makes a lot of sense for a goal. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with the fuzziness of it. I see your point about referring to policy, but I think policy is a better place to define it, whereas here we're setting an aspirational goal for, for meeting the reserves. Policy is more flexible. So the aspirational point is actually policy. No, the aspirational point is reserves. Right. reserves. It's established by policy that we've already approved. To ensure fiscal responsibility. Right. Right. With special emphasis on da 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 da. Right. 
Do you want a motion? I don't know that we need a motion for this. Um, well, I guess we do because we voted on this, didn't we? Yes. Um, in our I shall move. meeting. I second. Okay. And to be clear, what we all just voted on is a statement for 3A that says maintaining a balanced general fund with reserves that are in compliance with board policy. Right. All in favor? Um, I guess, Cynthia, you should do a roll call. Danny Kelly? Yes. Richard Dorn? Yes. Richard Dorn? Yes. Bruce Emod? Yes. Carol Matthews? Yes. Sally Biggin? Yes. Bonnie Deister? Yes. Colleen Mullery? Yes. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Trustee Kelly, so now you can take us back to the language that you would like to see added to goal number two, specifically language associated with the dashboard for equity. Yeah. Can you be more specific how you would like to see that? Yes, and Dr. Flamer, I don't know if the wording on this, I mean, ultimately, I would love to see a dashboard that guides the college specifically designed for equity. I know we have a dashboard for special student populations, um, but it, it doesn't really track the details of equity and diversity that we might need. And I don't know if I don't think that a board goal that specifically mentions Tableau or institutional effectiveness is a good board goal because it goes into the weeds. Do you have any advice for how, if, if it made sense for the board to have a dashboard like this, how might we word something like that for two? If you have any ideas, if you don't, um, I guess I might have to, do some wordsmithing here and try to pitch something to you, Dr. Mori. I would not use Tableau in here as a goal. However, uh, referencing our institutional effectiveness is, is really an appropriate goal because the IE uh, standards are board approved standards and targets anyway. So have, having that as part of, of a uh, dashboard is very, very effective. Do my fellow trustees agree that such a thing would be useful given what we've been learning about this issue of equity and diversity? And given that our own institutional effectiveness dashboards have bits and pieces of equity and diversity embedded in all of them, but that there's no centralized place where we can kind of focus on that as a goal. I, I certainly agree, Danny, that this is uh, important and I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that you raised it. I'm, I'm reflecting on what President Flamer just said and I'm look, President Flamer, what are you recommending? That we actually include this language in our goals or that you are going to take this forward? to create the dashboard that we're talking about that will stress measurements on how we're proceeding with equity. And that I, I would go ahead and move that forward on creating a dashboard. So you're saying that would actually be more of a goal for you as opposed to the board? Yes, it would. I'm good with that. Okay. Um, you, you had also mentioned that you wanted to see the um, equity in our in our mission. I mean, I'm looking at our mission right now. Yeah. So uh, I, I actually, if I oh. can just read it so that our colleagues know what it says, um, in case they don't have it in front of them. And I'm just focusing on the one sentence dealing with our current topic. We strive to create an inclusive environment that promotes and values diversity among students, faculty, and staff. So I think what you're asking for, Trustee Kelly, is that we also incorporate the word equity in our mission statement, if that's what you're asking. And if so, I mean, I'm happy to entertain that, but I don't think that's our conversation. I think that's a college-wide conversation. 
if we're talking about actually revising the statement? Well, I agree it's a college-wide conversation. And I also think that we need to be aspirational and actionable and that there should be something in here about through the support of equity or through the support of equitable practices or through, I, I've, I've read this mission like a million times and sometimes I've read it on a committee that should be modifying this. But after the stuff I've been learning this week through the webinar and with the the civil rights movements that are in action throughout our communities in the throughout the world today, I feel like this should be revisited to include language of equity. And I, I understand where you're coming from, Trustee Kelly. Um, I had asked um, President Flamer to send out the report that the Chancellor provided at a webinar I sat in on maybe four or five weeks ago, that was one of the best webinars I had sat in on dealing uh, specifically with um, issues of racism, structural racism and equity. And that's on our agenda. And I'm wondering if maybe we wanna hold this and then when we speak about what we can do, actionable, actionable items regarding structural racism, we might get to some of your concerns. I think that would be good. I do wanna say, that I also thought about this in the context of the vision statement. And I thought about this in the context of board full of philosophy, BP 1201, that I'd like to maybe think about. But thank you, I think I can wait. Would anybody like any chocolate? Did any, is there any way you could? Yes. So I, I want to get back to Trustee Kelly. I'm not really, I, I, I want to really hear you, Trustee Kelly, and understand what you're proposing that we do at this stage. And I'm, 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 not, I'm not clear on what you want us to do at this point. Hmm. Well, I think that you had suggested that we would maybe come back and revisit it after we have the, um, the uh, conversation 1.3, which I'm happy to do. Um, but if we need to make decisions on this now, then I would like language in here that talks about reviewing our mission, our vision, and BP 1201 to reflect the language of equity. Okay. So are, are you, I, I would like to get some closure on these goals. I'm looking at the time right now. Um, I, I think we were hoping that that this workshop would be about a two hour workshop and we're pushing up against 1130. So again, I, 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 I think all your points are really important and well made, uh, Trustee Kelly. Are you recommending that we add an additional goal or that we revise goal two? I'm a little unclear yeah. where you'd like us to go. I would like to revise, if we're passing this right now, uh, I would like to revise goal two to include a C to specifically review um, mission, vision, and if you want to be vague about it, board policies for language of equity and inclusion. Okay, of course, we already have a policy having us review mission. Um, with well, but I want it specifically to say equity and inclusion as a focus. Okay, and so I want this to be part of the annual, you know, let's review our policies while we're also thinking about budget and we're also thinking about programs and we're also thinking, I want it focused on equity and inclusion. So could you say that again? I'm writing it down. Um, um, the, the board will specifically review its mission, vision, and um, board policies. Board well, policies board and policies, I thought, procedures. Huh? All of the board policies? Well, <laughs> well again, it's just the, the, fil the filter is equity and inclusion. So right. any board policy or AP that doesn't have any hope for fitting that lens, we wouldn't have to do, right? I, you, you, you specified a, a one word policy in particular before. Yes, ma'am. I haven't written that down. 
BP 1201 philosophy. Which is ours. So I would, I would, I would encourage us at this point to cite that policy. Because to set a goal of reviewing all of our policies for that language, which I understand is, uh, that is a big, that is a big ask at this point. And we have, a, we already have a, a review of policies every so often that maybe we can put it in that. But I would move approval of, of your, um, of your statement uh, for mission, vision, and board policy 1201. <clears throat> for language on equity and inclusion. Yeah, so, so um, I would imagine, and, and I don't know if this is too much work right, that I'm volunteering Colleen Mullery for, um, as the president of the board or whoever may be in that role to, to maybe take the board and turn them into small ad hoc work groups to tackle various policies that might be affected by this. We don't have to use language that says a blanket review of, of all policies and APs. But I do think that these times right now require us to take some bold and decisive aspiration and action. And the action I think that would be good is like taking the policy review out of the network of ho-hum, we do this every year because it's one of the things we do, to we are specifically reviewing this stuff in this context. It, it, structural racism, as we'll get into, is so embedded throughout the system and not by anybody's evil intentions, <laughs> just by life and the way it goes on and the way these things happen that, that it's insidious and I feel like we need to tackle it with a lens. I'm sorry I'm being belligerent. I'm not trying to create more workforce. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, I, th I think that you're right, uh, Danny, that, um, that, we, that we need to, as you say, view them through that lens. And I realize that our, our current board, uh, not board policy, but our current policy uh, process runs through a five-year cycle that we're going to review every policy every five years. And is that correct? No, I, I'm sorry, I'm confusing two things. I, I'm, I'm confusing uh, courses and policies. I, I agree that with you that we need to do that. I do. I, I don't know what we want to put if, if we want to put that in this goal at this point with, for these goals, which end a year from now. But I'm sorry. I just want to say we did just go through all the policies. So yeah, we I, mean, did. I would be in favor of going through them all because some of them are, are pretty um, bland. Um, well, but I'm not, I'm not asking that we go through every policy. I'm asking that somebody go through the policies in general and say these might be effective. And they can do that in conjunction with Dr. Flamer or, or, or a team of his. But, but Richard, we went through those policies without thinking about George Floyd, without thinking about this crazy moment in our world history, without thinking about the pandemic, right? Big stuff has happened to our communities, to our students who are attending these classes. And I think it deserves a response from this board of equal measure. And maybe it is the work of reviewing whatever policies and, and administrative procedures should be reviewed in this lens. But I think that we need to put this lens on and take a deep look at ourselves as a board. Okay, I'm gonna stop preaching, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Trustee Kelly. So um, what Trustee Kelly has recommended and Present, Mallory. Yes, go ahead. Trustee. I don't know if you can see me, but uh, yeah. my hand is up. I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't seeing you, I'm sorry. That's okay, I'm, I'm easily unseen at my age. Uh, I, I think that 
uh, what Trustee Kelly is talking about is totally admirable. I think is long overdue. And I think the trigger is the events that have taken place over the last few months. I think from a board perspective, we have had policies and goals that we didn't achieve. We did 80%, we did 70%, and then we moved it to the next year and completed it. I think doing what he's asking for and not worrying about finishing it, I think it's, it's the least we can do. And if next year comes uh, July and we're not done, then we'll move the rest of it to the next year. But we've got to go forward. I, I think he is right on and I'm 100% in support of what he's saying. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who I'm not seeing with their hand raised? President yeah. Murray. Thank you. I actually, I made a motion, <laughs> which uh, uh, is okay, but um, I did specify the policy and I, I'm willing to um, change my motion to say that we would review our mission, vision, our mission and vision statements and board policies for language on equity and inclusion. I, I second, second that. that. Uh, yeah, and, and if, if we can continue to discuss that, um, may I just say something, um, President Flamer? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if the word language is the best word. I mean, we can just throw in the word equity and inclusion in every board policy and, you know, satisfy this goal. Review mission, vision, and board policies. Um, I think this was something that you said earlier, Danny, through, through a, a, a lens incorporating equity and inclusion. Um, because again, I think it's just too easy to throw in words and the words themselves not really meaning much. Um, President Flamer, you were going to say something before I jumped in there. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think, uh, Colleen, that you are ab absolutely correct in terms of just including the language isn't so, so much, is really important. However, just including the language misses I think what Danny and Bruce are, re are calling for and, call and Carol are calling for and Sally. Um, but if, if I can have a slight amendment of the motion and not just simply say uh, the, the board policies including philosophy and mission, but I would say all 1000s and 2000s because the board owns all of those policies and procedures. And so I would just keep it general and say all 1000s and 2000s will be reviewed through the lens of, of equity and inclusion, something to that effect. Yeah, President Molly, if I may, and, and it may be that the president of the board reviews them in a broad stroke and says, look, these won't, these maybe aren't necessary or whatever. That still to me is a board action. And then maybe we break out the parts that we can review through, by distributing through work groups. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I'm, I'm just trying to get this verbiage down right now. Um, well, I'm, I'm willing to, uh, I'm willing to amend my motion or withdraw my motion however you wish. I'm, I'd be happy that if we used the phrase with a lens on rather than language that i think is better and if we want to follow president flamer's suggestion i'm happy for it to say mission and vision and mission statements and board policies 1000s and 2000s since we own those those are the ones that we generate okay that makes sense I amend my second to reflect that change. So let me see if I'm getting this down. Um, we are adding to 
two A. A C. I thought it was two C. Two C. Yeah. I mean, excuse me. We're adding to two A C, and uh, that is to review our mission and vision. Excuse me. Review mission, vision, and board policies one thousand and two thousand through a lens through an equity and I'm having trouble with the words for this, through a lens incorporating. A lens on, I think you can say a lens on. There you go, thank you. Through a lens on equity and inclusion. And I just wanna thank you guys, uh, the, the wordsmiths on our board, thank you. Not my strong suit and I so appreciate you guys. Carol, thank you for putting the motion forward. Do I have a question? Yeah, go ahead, Richard. So we've had two different things. One is the way that's written, we're gonna review all the policies. And then at some point, Danny said the president would look at all the policies and we would look at which ones the president felt needed to be examined. So those are sort of two different statements. What? Well, I, I think one is, two uh, C is just simply our goal. And then what we're talking about is how we would go about trying to make that goal happen. Right. And I um, said that I would be happy to um, scan, I would do a quick scan of 1,000 and 2,000. And I think it should be a pretty easy job actually, because there will be some that just won't be relevant to, uh, for a review of this type. And then once I get that subset, then I certainly intend to ask my trustee colleagues to break down into work groups and to look at that subset. Yeah. I agree that that's, that's how we're going to do it, not the goal itself. It doesn't have to be stated in the goal. Yeah. So what we as, a, uh, as trustees are agreeing to do is once we have this subset of board policies 1,000 and 2,000 that will um, break down into work groups, ad hoc groups, whatever we want to call them, and then look at those policies more specifically and see if they should be revised as we review them with this lens of um, equity and inclusion. So we're approving a goal, but we're also agreeing to move forward and actually making this happen. Vote? Yeah, I think we're, are we ready to vote? Is there any more discussion on this? Hearing none, Cynthia, would you please take a roll call? Danny Kelly? Yes. Richard Dorn? Yes. Bruce Emod? Enthusiastically, yes. Carol Matthews? Yes. Sally Biggin? Sally Biggin? Yes. Bonnie Deister? Yes. Colleen Mullery? Yes. Yes. And, and that motion was just for the addition of 2C, correct? That's right. Okay. Thank you. So we've discussed uh, 3A. We've added an element to goal two. Uh, why don't we take it from the top and see if there is anything we need to address in goal number one. Hearing none, goal two we've already addressed. Goal three we've addressed, unless there's, you know, stop me if there's something else. Goal four. Okay, I just, I don't have a question or a change here. I just love that this language is in here. I think it leads and I think it encourages other bargaining units to get on board with this. Thank you. Uh, goal five. Goal six. Goal seven. Uh, 
goal eight. And goal nine. Excuse me, Pauline. Oh. Yeah, Pauline. it's Trustee Dorn. I was just wondering, I, I didn't think of it ahead of time on number eight. Yeah. Should, since we know we're going to have one new trustee, should we put anything in there? I mean, we're referring back to the policy about training that trustee. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there uh, just for a thought. I just think it's, we spelled that out in the policy regarding this yeah. and we referred specifically to new trustees. So mm -hmm. I, I think, I, I, I don't know that we need to restate it here. It's very clear in our policy. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Trustee Kelly, it looks like you're trying to raise your hand. Well, I'm just playing with the fuzz on my face because it's so weird and new to me. Okay. okay. So what I, I don't want, uh, Trustee Jordan, are you okay with that? That we just... Right, I just was throwing it out there. I mean, we did the, the I mean, we reinforced the policy when we did the budget, I mean, the reserve. So I was just throwing out, I'm fine to move on to nine. What, what I, I don't want to lose track of is the um, advice that um, Sally had sent out regarding a, a different approach. And I, and I agree with, I think, what Trustee Dorn and, and Sally and Trustee Biggin said is that we're not ready today to actually revise our entire um, set of goals. But I do think it's something that we might want to consider our next time around. I'd also be interested if we do want to look right. at- Well, I do want to uh, touch on number nine before we go away. Okay, let me just finish this thought and then okay. table shares. Um, I would be interested to hear at that time, President Flamer's feelings about combining board goals and president goals. I, I have to chew on that a little bit because I feel like president goals are, are more operational and we all know we don't want to move in a direction where our board goals are sounding operational they should not be i'm not saying sarita's goals were operational but i i, I just have i just have to think about that you know if we do decide going forward that we want to combine board goals and um President Goals. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, President Flamer. Oh, I most certainly do. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity. Um, you are absolutely correct. We do not want the board goals to even come close to sounding as if they're operational. We, we don't want to walk backwards in that regard. However, I think it's really important that the president's goals are aligned mm -hmm. with the board goals, not that mm -hmm. they match, but are lines so people can see where mine came from. Right. right. Yeah. So, it's just that top-down approach to uh, developing uh, goals and objectives, the old Drucker approach. Exactly. Yeah. exactly right. so, so can I make a comment? Yeah, and then I see yeah. uh, Trustee Kelly's hand is up. Uh, and mine. So who, who, who do you want to call on first? Go ahead, Sally. You, okay. I, I wanted to say uh, our role as a board is set the goals for, you know, the what goals. And it, then it's up to administration to figure out how they're going to do it. I, I don't know that, that the president has to, we don't have to approve necessarily how the president is going to do it. We just approve what the president's going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't you know, recently, at, you know, looked at, at President Flamer's goals in terms of are they the how he's doing it kind of goals or are they what he, you know, what goals. But um, I just, that to me would be the only reason that the board and the president's goals would be aligned in terms of what the goals are, but not, you know, how it's going to be uh, implemented or, or achieved. 
Well, I, you know, I am looking at his goals right now and um, some wouldn't work in this new approach. For example, revise the education facilities master plans. You know, that's, a, that's an operational goal. Um, but again, I think we're getting a little bit off track. I think it's something that when we revisit this our next time around, we should strongly consider it. Um, but I don't think today's the day to be changing our approach. Danny, uh, Trustee Kelly, you, your hand was up and as was Trustee Matthews. So why don't you go ahead, Trustee oh, Kelly, and I see those. Mine's related to nine and Dorn was in line ahead of me for number nine, but it, at your pleasure, Madam President. Why don't you go ahead. Okay, uh, so uh, regarding nine, I just want to say, you know, sitting on the foundation board, and, and Dr. Mullery can talk to this to this as well. The foundation is doing big things, and as community representatives to the board of trustees, I think it would behoove us to be uh, more closely engaged uh, with what the foundation is doing and understand because. They are seriously focusing on and tackling big community issues and trying to make CR a place where discussions and learning uh, from the community can kind of happen on some of these uh, more current moments and, and, and things like they were working on emergency preparedness before the whole pandemic thing hit. They're working on economic resilience right now. Lots of great things. So I, I love that this goal is in here. Um, I'm not sure uh, if there are things that we should change about the language of it uh, because it, it just kind of seems kind of, um, it's not very aspirational as a goal. It's kind of like, of course we should be doing that. Um, so it, it'd be nice to see something a little more inspirational there. Pass. I don't have a recommendation <laughs> at the moment yet. Go ahead, Trustee Doran. Um, I did, before I did number nine, I just want to mention I, I pretty much I agree with you regarding the president's and the board's goals. And if you look at some of the goals that are in the I I don't want to keep saying what Sally gave us, but there some of that we the trustees have no business doing. It would be I would question accreditation with it. But when I said the board the goal should be aligned together is meaning that we shouldn't be in conflict with one another. Okay. So, and then regard and then and regarding number nine, I like the language of the goals that Sally gave that said maintain the capacity of the foundation during economic uncertainty. Um well, let me get to the rest of the speakers list. Um, on, maybe we should just stick with number nine. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. Uh, Carol or Bruce, did you want to speak to number nine or should we address specifically what uh, Danny and Richard are talking about in terms of number nine? I was not talking about number nine. How about you, Bruce? No, I, I was, I wanted to talk about goals of president and the, and the board. So, so, so let's speak to number nine um, so we can get some closure on that. Uh, Richard, what, I, I don't have Sally's or Cerrito's goals right in front of me. What was it that it said? Maintain the capacity. I, I don't know if ca capacity seems like that would be hard to measure. I don't know what the you what uh, that their goal is enhancing organizational effectiveness. The um, sub you know the objective is to maintain the capacity of the foundation. Uh, I don't know what their issues are with their foundation, so I don't know that it would be appropriate for us to use that language. Mallory? Yeah, let, let me go to Danny since he okay. um, first okay. brought this up and then I'll get back to you, Carol. Yeah, well, I'm going to be really inspirational here and pivot to Dr. Flamer. Maybe he could uh, think about this because, you know, I'm, I'm at the foundation trust, you know, board level, but not really the operational level. So I guess what I'm wondering is I, I see 
Marty doing things. I see him doing things aligned with some of the initiatives you put forth, Dr. Flamer, but I don't know what challenges he has addressing those and accomplishing those that could use support from this board. So perhaps you have some language for number nine that would be aspirational and also maybe measurable for the board. I don't have anything on the top of my head right now, but I'll give that some thought. Uh, Trustee Matthews, did you want to speak to this? Well, I wasn't feeling the need to change the, the, um, the wording of the goal because um, the foundation has, the foundation is the one holding those aspirational goals. And I feel like if we are regularly monitoring or reviewing and supporting the progress that that that's, that's what we need to be doing. And if we aren't hearing enough from Marty in his monthly reports on the foundation, we can ask him to include a wider range of information or, or, or something like that, or to explain the kind of thing that Danny's talking about. Um, but I mean, we, we aspire the foundation to do its best, but that's, it's really their work. Um, yeah, yeah. A separate auxiliary. And of course we do have two trustees on the foundation board. Right. And you know, it's, and I, I we have heard from, from you during um, Marty's reports about uh, the foundation's work, but we can encourage you to round out what he's saying at, at every, you know, occasion so that we have a full picture of um, the efforts that the foundation is making that Danny's talking about. Yeah, in, in lieu of other language, I'm, I'm happy with the Cerritos language, uh, but I'm also, I, I see what you're saying and I, I could support leaving the language as is. I, I do think that there's something missing from our aspiration on that, but it's not, since I don't have any specific language, we can move on. So um, we've gotten through the nine goals and I think we've made all the um, revisions. Uh, Trustee Ema, did you have a revision to these goals or did you just wanna speak in general about them? Uh, I wanna just, just on, on uh, the board and president's goals, I just wanted to uh, speak in generalities and be on the record that we over the last uh, 15 years have come a long ways and I would be very reticent to step backward and make those lines fuzzy again and goals if the board goals and president goals are mirror image of each other it will make that line so fuzzy that for the right type of a trustee slipping back into that micromanaging and taking over operational side of the business becomes extremely easy and sanctified. And so this is your ball game. I'm, I'm a short timer, I'm dead and gone. But please, please leave a Chinese wall between the board and the president and avoid any impression of running back and forth between those two. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Flamer, or excuse me, President Flamer. I, Trustee Imad, thank you for those wise words. We should adhere to those, and I fully support that as well. I do too. Uh, Trustee Matthews. Okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to refer to number seven. I am not suggesting a change in the wording, uh, but one of the things that came up this week that was really on my mind is is part of what seven is, and so I really wanted to bring it to attention because 
in the convocation in uh, President Flamer's presentation and then in the presentation from a team that is working on revising the new education master plan. And I would use the word maybe reimagining the education master plan. Um, there is, uh, I mean, the message to me was there is tremendous change coming uh, for various reasons, some much coming out of the pandemic, perhaps technology, et cetera, in, in college education, in uh, decentralizing college education, and the choice that students will have, and how that should impact our education master plan and how it's going to impact our, the college, the, the programs we're offering, the degrees we're offering, the way that we're doing it. Um, that was what I heard from both of those discussions. So I, I'm not suggesting we have to change this because this goal includes all of that with special emphasis on creating a vision for the district's future competitive advantage. And I think that's what, uh, I hope I'm reading this correctly, President Flamer, that that's what the, um, the big time revision of our education master plan is about. And of course we do review that, you know, when it comes to us, I would like to, to hope that we will get some information on the development of that new education master plan as it goes, rather than just hearing, you know, hearing it to approve at the end. But I think number seven, I'm, I'm not suggesting any rewording, I'm just saying, suggesting how important this will be to us in the coming year. Thank you, Trustee Matthews. Uh, are we uh, ready to uh, vote to accept the goals um, as revised? I think we already voted on those revisions. Did we? Move to approve all the goals <laughs> as revised. I'll second. Second. Cynthia, will you do roll call? Danny Kelly? Yes. Richard Dorn? Yes. Bruce Emod? Yes. Carol Matthews? Yes. Sally Biggin? Yes. Bonnie Deister? Yes. Colleen Mullery? Yes. Thank you. That was really a, um, an important conversation. I, I, I very much appreciated it. Um, I'm looking at the clock. It's uh, on my clock, it's 12.03. Um, are we ready for maybe a, a, at least a 30-minute discussion on our last agenda item? Yes. Yeah, we should be able to yes. structural racism in 30 minutes. It's kind of <laughs> Oh, man. I, I just feel like there's so many big things coming at us, and there's just not enough time. <sighs> So could you uh, pull that up, Cynthia? So it's on our screen. Would you like the link or the attachment? The attachment, please. So this um, was sent out to you shortly after I first saw it. And um, it, it goes to what many of you have already been saying, and that is that we don't want to just throw out the words, diversity, equity, inclusion, blah, 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 um, but to actually look at what we can do to address issues of uh, structural racism in institutions, in this case, of higher education. Could you scroll down, please, Cynthia? I have a comment. Yes. Oh, go ahead. So you'll notice, um, speaking to what Trustee Kelly was talking about, the next to the last bullet, well, I wish they would actually number bullets. Um, actually, it's the two of them. Call out casual racism, racial structures, policies, and examine your policies uh -huh. uh, for racism. Is, is there mm -hmm. more, um, Cynthia, can you just sc scroll through the whole thing so we can see what we're looking at here? Yeah, 
Can President oh. Murray? Yeah, Trustee Matthews. So there's there's a lot of things on here. I don't I don't know if we in a half an hour can run down this whole list and look at what we can do. But one one suggestion that I have that came out of the um, the uh, triple CT trustee webinar and uh, the, just various other inputs and that addresses the question of action and what what can we do. Um, and one of them that struck me is that we have the ability to pass resolutions. Now, that passing a resolution is an action. <laughs> the resolution is, is not an active, it's a statement. But going to the, the fact that we have the ability, uh, the potential um, to set tone uh, and to, to uh, you know, kind of drive direction, um, I think that uh, that resolutions that make statements of our position on various issues can be very powerful. And uh, there were some examples in one of the uh, webinars that uh, from um, uh, from I believe it was Foothill that, uh, but in that that might not be correct. There were several community colleges participating, <clears throat> but there were a uh, uh, suggestions, I mean, just examples of resolutions that this, this particular board had passed that were expressing uh, positions, so to speak, on um, various issues or on, you know, what, what you would want to see happening. So I, I would like us to keep in mind that, that, um, that resolutions, I think, could be uh, very powerful in terms of statements of the board's um, position on on uh, issues or uh, aspirations for the college. Thank you, Trustee Matthews. Uh, Trustee Kelly has had his hand up. I, uh, Trustee Matthews, I love that recommendation and it ties in so nicely to the board advocacy stuff we've been talking about. I don't know, we never even thought of that, uh, but I love that recommendation. I wanted to, to take a minute to just talk to my colleagues about a uh, transformation that happened in me this week around this stuff. And that is every month on the agenda, there is board member conference and I always keep my mouth shut. I'm doing all kinds of work in the background on behalf of the college and other organizations that I'm involved in that align with the college and um, some of these things that we're tackling now. And I never say anything about it because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to take up time and we got to get through this meeting and nobody wants to hear this crap anyway. But what I'm thinking about now is the work that I'm doing as an ally out there. And I think students in our community need to hear that our board is actively engaged in those things. I'm going to do a better job of stepping up and commenting during those times about this stuff not to puff up myself or some political ambition stuff and not to take up your valuable time. I want to apologize in advance for doing it, but I'm going to call it out because I want other people to read it in the minutes. I want other people to see it when they tune into our meetings. And I want people to know that our trustees are out there and we are doing things and we should stop being afraid of talking about those things in the member comment section. That's it. Pass. That's an excellent, um, excellent point. How would you like to proceed with this, folks? Was there anything in particular on this document that resonated with you? You know, there were some, uh, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not suggesting something we can do or how, how to go about this, but one of the things that uh, impressed me in the discussion of, um, I think this one was through the, um, Chancellor's office was um, this idea, this uh, microaggressions concept, and in that discussion, uh, the examples were being called were, were being uh, cited regarding students' um, experience in the classroom or or on campus anyway, and the ones I recall were from the from the classroom, where. Uh, um, one example was a student whose uh, name was to many of us uh, 
unfamiliar, hard to pronounce. And so the professor was stumbling on it and asked the student, well, can you just anglicize your name for me so I can say it? And <laughs> when you really think about uh, the implication of that, that's, that's truly what they were referring to as a microaggression, a, a racist, you know, aggressive attitude towards that student on what might seem like a small level. Um, other examples were when a student wanted to cite um, or refer to uh, um, an African-American philosopher, I think, uh, I think it was in philosophy, but in any case, expert who was African-American in the field, and the professor just laughed it off as not being uh, important enough, um, you know, to to, to to include in the conversation uh, and in his, you know, or her whatever expertise. Um, I, I was very struck by the fact that it can be, you know, these small things that can have such a huge influence. And I think, I think this is, can only be addressed by, you know, a consciousness raising across the college community. Um, it's, you know, I don't know about writing it down somewhere. I, I think we have to look at how can we, um, it talks about, you know, we can talk about policy and all, but how can we, um, you know, what workshops, what processes, what something can be included you know, in our, in our experience in the college across the board to address that kind of thing. Um, book of the year was another thing that came to my mind, which is not a board role to choose the book of the year, but it has a potential there to have a big impact. Maybe we need our own book of the year. Well, we could do that. Um, so I see Trustee Ema and I think Trustee Kelly has his hand up again. So Trustee Ema, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. I, uh, I, I, ha I have two comments on this uh, uh, document. One, I think it's, uh, it's very aspirational. It points out a lot of good points and, uh, and it's very educational. But taking that into the next phase is a Herculean job because it's like saying somebody has malaria and they're not taking their quinine and they're drinking uh, tea and then every two weeks they're going to get the shakes. These diseases are ingrained over many, many generations and for us to deal with them we need to take small bites and come up with policies that we can enforce, enforce if it happens, zero tolerance. We can hold all the seminars. We had a seminar on unconscious bias. And I don't wanna mention any names. And there was one individual in there that was participating, uh, not a board member, obviously. At a later date, I have observed that very individual spouting quite uh, uncomfortable thoughts, like that seminar had no effect whatsoever. So my point being that we can hold seminars, we can hand out books, we can put uh, uh, all kinds of aspirational posters on the hallways, None of it will work unless we have policies and rules that are black and white and say, you do not do this, you do that, and this is the consequence, and then carry on. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Imad. Trustee Kelly. Um, Trustee Imad, I, I think that uh, the, what, what you said just now uh, is, is excellent, and I think that um, maybe the tie is what uh, Trustee Matthews was recommending about perhaps us focusing on some resolutions. I was recently elected the chair of the Humboldt County Democratic Central Committee and one of the things that I am doing is asking the communication and education subcommittee 
which basically passes resolutions that as the executive board and the other committees of the, of the central committee that we only take actions on things that that committee has put forth as resolutions for the general membership to vote on. And that we only take actions on those things that the general membership has and has approved. Now, I'm not saying that we need to do that here, but I think that by leading with a resolution uh, and that those resolutions may be will that the creation of those resolutions will lead to our thinking about policies that we can enact and change. I think that the resolution recommendations that Matthew's had for our board going forward may be a way to achieve that, to, to set our aspirational goals, but also to, to direct our next steps towards policy. Totally. And, and then the last thing I wanted to say is the thing that um, is still giving me goosebumps now, and the thing that I fought against the most with some of the activism on the far extremes of both sides of the political divide these days. I, I have resisted uh, labeling myself a feminist. I've resisted labeling myself an anti-racist because I felt like they were just buzzwords that people throw out to say things. But in this moment now and going forward, I want our board to be anti-racist. And, and I think that concept is very important and I would like to see us agendize a resolution taking a stance that this board is an anti-racist board. Um, the language is so strong and I, I tremble sometimes when I think about some of the negative impacts of this from folks, uh, you know, politically, financially, you know, I, I know there was a lot of fears expressed at the foundation level when we were talking about language around this stuff. You know, are people going to stop donating to us because we're we're just jumping on to the the bandwagon of the of the you know activism word of the day? But damn it, if not now, when? When are we going to do it? And now is the time. So, I guess what I'm asking is that we agendize language, a resolution capturing our aspirations here. Um, I, I hear exactly what uh, Bruce is saying, Bruce, about, uh, about, you know, how to create this change. And um, I think sometimes policies, rules, consequences are appropriate. But my own experience, because I haven't exactly been uninterested, but my own experience in, in listening to um, just expression of concepts and uh, uh, identifying, um, you know, actions and attitudes that, uh, you know, bringing them to the forefront of our consciousness has, uh, I mean, it has worked with me. <laughs> and so I think that that we we can't abandon the idea of uh, resolutions for one or discussions or policy changes, uh, what, you know, what is available to us to, um, as the saying goes, raise the consciousness about persons, uh, for people. I think that some of these are ideas are not uh, are not things that people wouldn't um, adopt so much as not being aware of of some of the things. I, I just I, I just was very um, I, I was impressed with a lot of what I was hearing, and I think you know there are obviously uh, other people who will be, even if it isn't everybody. Thank you, Trustee Matthews. Trustee Biggin, your hand is up. Yes, I, I remember um, when Professor Johnson, um, I don't, I, was it a letter that was read at our board meeting or was it a statement he made about the importance of uh, really defining the vocabulary that we're using? And uh, Dr. Flamer, you mentioned uh, your plan to uh, 
address some of that language and help us um, clarify, you know, how we're interpreting the language. Um, and I, I recently started reading How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is on this document. And the way they def define it was a very different approach to it because it, it was talking about biases and prejudice that we have against not just ethnic groups, but um, gender issues and um, uh, religious issues, um, other areas of equity. And I wondered if maybe um, Dr. Flamer would talk about some of his plans that he had in mind for our campus community relating to, uh, to how we're going to agree upon the vocabulary so that we're talking about the same thing in the future. Dr. Dr. Mallory, may I Please. begin? Please. Yes, um, first to begin, thank you very much. We, we started doing, having those conversations this summer right after the board approved my new goals through the Keep Teaching site. Um, Wendy Riggs and Aaliyah uh, Dun Dunphy, who is our director of the Multicultural and Diversity Center, they held a six part series conversations with faculty and staff about, about equity and diversity, both in the classroom and, and outside the classroom through the Keep Teaching site. And I, I was up and I had the opportunity of uh, going to three of them where we had faculty that were talking about their experience in the classroom of inadvertently having mi microaggressions and not even understanding what they were doing and why they were doing them and the effect it had on students. Right. So it, it is simply amazing that our faculty um, don't see themselves as racist, but they're quite frankly, they're somewhat ignorant about their own behavior. And it, it was quite amazing to hear and to see our faculty engaging in long conversations about their own experiences and being very apologetic about how, because they were ignorant about the behavior, what it caused their students. Um, so it was a great conversation and we had to keep cutting it off because people wanted to, to share their own personal experiences about these topics. We started talking about terms and trying to define those terms this summer. Um, I asked Aaliyah to, uh, kind of slowed down that conversation over the summer because we don't have the faculty on contract. So we are going to set up a much larger conversation in October that um, she is arranging and probably have a facilitator come in and start talking about equity, diversity, and terms and how do we define those. So right now we're starting to plan something for a, a month and a half from now to start those conversations as, as, a, as a district. Thank you. And oh, I just the other part of it, I wanted to say that um, I'm learning from some of this reading I'm doing. A, a book I would highly recommend is White Fragility, because that talks about why is it so hard for um, people who, you know, are not of color to talk about racism. And I check that book out of the library and it was so profound and I realized I needed to mark it up like a college textbook. I had to go out and buy, buy a copy so I could start really marking it up like a textbook and really analyzing it. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of homework that we need to do um, both individually and as an institution. It's, you know, it's very complicated. And I'm, I'm really glad that we're starting to have these conversations and maybe we can continue, you know, to have opportunities to dive deeper into what it means to be an anti-racist and, um, and how to call out it when we see it. And it, again, it's not just ethnicity, you know, it's economics, you know, it's, it's gender, color, you know, body size, body type, um, you know, there's, there's just so many areas of racism that exist that need to be addressed. It, it's very complicated. 
Thank you, Trustee Higgin. Uh, Trustee Kelly, your hand is up. Uh, Dr. Flamer, how are you imagining dealing with faculty or students who don't want to go this way, who don't want to go this direction? I'm reminded of the comment in open session from the public, uh, from one of our faculty, who kind of reiterated that we don't have a problem. Um, because I imagine that at some point this kind of stuff is going to go come to a head with folks and you know I, I am a big fan of build your team so in my businesses and stuff it's all about like it's all about the whole point of the business is learning how to be better faster stronger and it's all about like what you, you make a, a you know it used to be back in the day with businesses you'd hire an employee and they'd eventually buy the business from you because you know, they stayed with your company for so long. And I'm trying to get back to that idea with some of the businesses that I'm, I'm building where we're committed to our team. And even when they screw it up, they lose a big contract or they, they screw up language or, or cause somebody to leave the company or whatever. We work with them and we continue to stay committed to them. But man, ed code and faculty and tenure and contract negotiations, all that crap is just so complicated and so like uh, structure. And so I guess, you know, and the process of this, as, as Trustee Biggin just mentioned, there's so much homework that goes into this stuff. Like, I feel so behind the reading that I'm doing is slow because I have to reflect on it. I have to think about it. How does it apply to me? You mentioned, Dr. Flamer, some of the conversations you were having and how faculty just wanted to talk about their own personal experiences so much because we don't, as white people, so often talk about this stuff and think about it. And we just want to get it off our chest and get it out there and deal with all the guilt we're feeling and things. And sometimes it's not the right forum for it and there's limited time and we got to keep moving. And so like there is all this work here. So what's your commitment? Uh, what, what are your intentions and commitments and plans operationally to handle this stuff when people or when faculty or students don't want to go there or can't or whatever? A long winded question. Sorry. No, actually, actually it's, it's the perfect question, uh, Trustee Kelly. Um, I will answer it in two parts, if you will. The first part is how do, I, how, do, how do I get people to move in a direction is to simply state it. Here's where we're going. Our end goal is this. And giving everyone the opportunity, regardless of their viewpoint, I need to be able to make sure that I listen to every viewpoint, whether they agree with me or not. But I want every voice to be heard. And what, what happens at, at, at CR and probably other higher ed institutions is, is the voices that are the loudest are the ones that, drum, that drown out all the other voices. And CR has a habit of doing that. I'm trying my best and planning is to make sure that even the quietest voices, regardless of what that viewpoint is, is have, give the opportunity. But to also, I, I want to lay out the canvas and give people a chance to paint on it. And the canvas is that CR is moving forward. We are going to have these conversations because it's the right thing for us as an institution and our students to have this, these conversations and not being afraid of having the conversations. I think what people hear is that people here are afraid to even talk about it. And as, as you said earlier, Trustee Kelly, if not now, when do we do it? This is the time to have those conversations. And I don't know what the outcomes are going to be, except to have the conversations. And I think we will have the answers as people start talking and learning to listen regardless of what the narrative that they've grown up with are or is. Um, but we'll have those conversations all through fall semester. And quite honestly, the November election gives us the best opportunity right now to have those conversations across the political spectrum. And giving people like Gary Sokolow, who spoke against it, giving him a chance to have, have the conversation and get his viewpoint out. Because what I've learned here is the more you silence those, those detractors, the 
the more that he or she will get allies on the faculty to push their agenda. So I don't, I, so I want to hear what's called every, every uh, deviant idea and to hear them, but I don't necessarily stop action because they don't like it. We move forward, but everyone has a role to play. Anyway, that's a long answer to your short questions. Thank you. Okay. I am looking for, I don't want to miss someone's hand being raised. Yes, Trustee Deister. One thing I wanted to make a <clears throat> comment about in the nursing and medical field, we actually have content in all of the courses about how to deal with our multiracial problems with all of these things we're discussing. Uh, we talk about them in class. We talk about them and we explain to the students that since they're in healthcare and they're dealing with all these variety of people, that they have to be able to treat everybody with respect and to not get this racism thing. Uh, of course, there's going to be difficult people, but if you get most nurses, most healthcare professors, most people that are dealing with the public day in and day out, this is part of their training. And so it's kind of nice to know that at least there is some content out there that's being taught and I taught it for years and, and it's being taught in all the nursing programs and uh, to these people so that there's a lot of uh, good people out there that really believe in what we're talking about. Thank, thank you, Trustee Deister. I have one other comment that I, I th it, it's not an immediate uh, fix and of course there aren't any immediate fixes uh, but one of the things that we have talked about that we strengthened in our goals uh, before and which I think we as an institution um, need to continue to work on so hard and for the board to look at how can we through policy resolution whatever affect this because it's not our job so to speak and that is equity and diversity in hiring. Um, faculty, staff, what, whatever position we're talking about. Um, there was some discussion among trustees because this is not our job, so to speak, to hire. How can we influence that? And I, I think that to the greater extent that we can improve, increase, whatever you want to say, strengthen uh, our uh, diversity uh, on our faculty and staff that will move all of this forward um, that I, I, I believe in the classroom and out that, that that will has the potential to make such a huge difference uh, it's not fast but I think that's a huge part of the answer if if I could raise my hand and jump in here mm -hmm. Um, first of all, Carol, one thing that I think we might all consider doing is there is um, some legislation right now that um, would allow more affirmative action yeah. in, in higher education. Proposition 16. Right. Um, because that, at least when I was active in hiring, that was um, problematic, at least for HSU, the fact that that uh, affirmative action had, had been revoked. I, I guess um, I, I've been sitting here thinking and I probably shouldn't be, but um, I, I was actually reflecting on the Saturday, the day after Josiah Lawson, the HSU student was, was um, murdered at a party in Arcata several years ago now. In the cabinet, I was a member of the cabinet, um, we were all called to campus that Saturday to address this very serious issue. Of course, at the time, we had no idea where it was going to go, except one of our students um, had, had died, was dead, was stabbed to death at a party. Um, but th the reason I got thinking about that, it was just such a dreadful time, is what happened as a result of all that. And um, now I am talking HSU. When we brought in a number of speakers, we had workshops, 
every aspect of the university got very um, engaged in this concern about how, in this case, African-American st students were being treated or respected or not respected and what was going on in the classroom. And of course, this also involved the city. Uh, and a number of initiatives um, resulted from the, um, the tragic death of uh, Josiah Lawson regarding racism and, and structural uh, racism. But, but my point is, if I have a point, I've been thinking about this, is I, this needs to be, if we're addressing structural racism, we are addressing structural racism, racism it has to be institution-wide. It can't just be the trustees. Mm -hmm. and I think it is institution-wide. I think it is college-wide. I'm really pleased that we're talking about it as a board, um, but it really needs to be, you know, an all hands on deck kind of approach. And I think um, President Flamer is doing an excellent job of, of making that an all hands on deck because it just needs to permeate every, every conversation, you know, e even curriculum. I mean, there's just so much that, that can and should be done to address these serious issues. And um, I, going back to one of um, Trustee Matthews' uh, excellent suggestions earlier regarding resolutions, uh, I'll, I'll volunteer to at least draft a resolution on, on structural racism and, and um, or on, on the board being anti-racist. I think that's where we are at this point in time. And um, I'll draft it and put it out there and get your feedback and, and, and we'll see what we can do with that. If you all are in agreement. Yes. I, I would suggest- um, Thank you. Uh, also, um, because uh, Ranch mentioned uh, Proposition 16. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. We talked about board advocacy. We've talked about resolutions. One possibility is that the board would pass a resolution in favor of support of Proposition 16. President Flamber, well, well, you know, what, what do you think about that? I think two things. One, it's, it's just an, uh, I think it's a phenomenal idea, both operationally and from yeah. a leadership point of view, it points to how effective the board wants to be as leaders in very difficult times and difficult conversations. So it sets a good tone for the institution as a whole. Thank you. Let's see. I'm looking at my trusty colleagues. So uh, one thing that I think the lead resolution that um, we could Trustee Biggin, if you're speaking, we can't. I can't hear you in any event. No. I think we lost her. She dropped the call, unfortunately. She's gone. She's gone. I think where she was going is that there's a lead resolution on this proposition, and we might be able to um, get a copy of that, and essentially uh, support and endorse that. So, just, go ahead, Trustee Kelly. Uh, I just, I just wanted to thank Trustee Matthews again for bringing up the idea of resolutions. I, I'm, I'm you know. That's such a good first step for us, I think. Um, and that we can maybe use those as a way to educate ourselves on some of these other things that the chancellor is recommending to lead the way um, with actual actions. So I just, the, every time I reflect on the brilliant suggestion you came up with here, I, I just I feel like this is breaking something free for us. Thank you. And I think I see um, Trustee Bigging calling in. Are you with us? Is that you, Sally? Still having some difficulty hearing her. Um, alrighty. Well, all I was going to say is I, I think this document that was provided to us from the Chancellor's Office is, 
at least something I intend to keep with me during board meetings, because it's one of those things that um, I think I would personally find useful going back and, and reviewing and seeing ways that we can really be more proactive in addressing structural racism. Um, I see your, if that's you, Sally, you're on mute. Can we un ask to unmute? I tried to unmute her. It is her cell phone number. Okay. Well, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, I, you know, this has the day goes on. My coverage gets less and less. But I'm going to keep the phone on and continue to listen. Is there anything I needed to respond to while I was offline? Well, you were saying, Sally, and I, and then we lost you, that uh, the League had um, a resolution regarding the uh, Affirmative Action Proposition. Is that right? I think they're getting ready to prepare some documents. Okay. So we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. That's what I thought you were, where you were going with that. So uh, if you get a copy of that when it's ready, if you could... Um, send that to uh, Keith and myself, we can look it over and see what we can do with it. You shouldn't send it to the whole board, obviously. Yes. Okay. Well, folks, I think we did pretty well for a Zoom workshop. Um, is there anything anyone would like to say before I consider bringing this to a close? And just to review in terms of my action items, uh, I'll be um, scanning uh, policies 1000 and 2000 for their applicability to um, equity and inclusion. And I will also be, of course, drafting a resolution um, declaring the board to be an anti-racist board. And I think that's that. I think President Flamer is going to be looking at a dashboard for equity. I have a lot of notes here, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's definitely action items on my end. Anyone else? Excellent workshop. Cynthia, I want to specifically thank you for spending a Saturday with us. My pleasure. That's a it's very, very kind of you. And I don't think I had an opportunity to thank Dr. Hill and uh, Kathy Cox for joining us on a Saturday. So if you'll um, pass on the board, thanks, Keith. I, I, I would appreciate it. Uh, I guess we will be meeting again on September 1st. Can you believe September 1st is right around the corner? Nope. Thank you all. I hope you enjoy this last week of August the last week of kind of you. All right. Well, thank, thank you for the great job you've done yeah. in our meeting today. No, I didn't know about that.